How is everybody? Good? All right. Can you hear me okay in the back? You can. Okay. Welcome. Glad you all are here. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Poetry Center. Uh, my name is Tyler. I work here as the director at the Poetry Center. Thrilled you guys are here for a reading tonight. Uh, excellent choosing of your Thursday night activities. I commend you. Um, and I want to tell you about a couple upcoming events at the Poetry Center that uh, we want to make sure you know about. We'd love to see you back here uh, for a few readings that are coming up in March. So this is our last, this is a special day that we don't always do readings on, on Leap Day. Uh, and so, um, so this is a special thing that has been created especially for Matthew Zapruder. Um, I'm kidding. But we are thrilled that Matthew's back in Tucson to share work with us. Uh, and as a great friend of the Poetry Center and, um, and a thrill to have him back in this part of the world. Um, coming up in March, I want to tell you, so our next event at the Poetry Center that's a reading will be with um, the, uh, the, the poet John Murillo. John is our, our spring poet in residence, so he's going to spend about 10 days with us, work on some new material in the Poets Cottage, and then do a reading for us, and that's going to be on the 14th. So after you're exhausted and recovered from the Festival of Books, You'll feel great about going to a poetry reading again, and uh, that will be on the Thursday of the 14th with John Murillo, 7 o'clock here at the Poetry Center. On the 21st, there's a celebration of Orly Sheehan, uh, another great friend of the Poetry Center um, and a writer who we lost last year, uh, and a great friend at, at the University of Arizona and for writing in general in this part of the United States and broadly everywhere. Um, and so we're thrilled to be celebrating Orly and her work, and that's open to the public, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock. Um, and there is probably going to be some lemonade and carrot cake involved before that reading, if you're so inclined. Details still to be sorted, but um, please come help us celebrate Orly and her work uh, and to, um, to listen to, uh, to so many that she was an influence for. Um, and at the end of March, we have a reading with the poet Soretta Morgan, who has a first book coming out uh, called Alt Nature, and we're really excited about this book and this project. That's on the 28th of March back here at 7 o'clock uh, at the Poetry Center. And there will be an encore performance connected to that. Um, that book includes a kind of polyvocal section. And so on the Friday, we're going to partner up with Mocha Tucson. And there will be an event where that polyvocal part of the book will come alive with a, a group of different readers. So you can hear from both parts of that Thursday night here on the 28th at the Poetry Center, Friday the 29th at Mocha uh, for the performative part of that piece as well. Lots of great things coming up. Um, you can find out about all of those things in this calendar, which will tell you nearly all of it, and, and the Poetry Center website is a great place to check as well. So if you don't have one of these, they're available uh, around the corner on the table next to the book selling station, which is a thing to know about. Books are for sale. Uh, and so we hope after the reading, we'll skip a Q&A, but we want you to come hang out with Matthew and speak with him. So come buy a book and come speak with him afterwards, uh, and I'm sure that the bookstore will be happy to sell you as many as they have. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome up uh, a good friend of the Poetry Center, Joni Wallace, to help introduce Matthew uh, to you all. Joni Wallace um, is a, a, a great poet here in Tucson. Her most recent collection, it's her third full length, and it is called Landscape with Missing River. Um, she's a frequent uh, collaborator with the Poetry Center and an instructor with us. Landscape with Missing River was the Arizona New Mexico Book Award winner from last year, and we're thrilled that uh, Joni's here with us. So please help us welcome Joni Wallace. Yeah. Thank you. A Matthew Zapruder poem is a strange, sincere, funny, melancholic, capacious entity, and unmistakably his own. The poems often contain the flint of his poet ancestors, Dickinson, Tate, Keats, Ceylon, Whitman, Moore. These sparks fly off the wheels as the poems go. He apostrophizes and odes. He engages syntax in subtle ways, but to great effect. Many of the poems in his latest collection, Father's Day, are carved from one long sentence, then razored into short lines, and the effect of it is a kind of kinesthesia, hearkening waterfall. At times, these waterfalls are carved from acrylic and found in a futuristic mall court, food court. But regardless, you, dear reader, will tumble down and through these poems. And at the bottom, rather than death, find yourself very much alive in a pool of silence. 
Other Zapruder's poems employ longer lines, syntactically stretched phrases. These create the feeling of leaves, like maple leaves, floating down from the arms of trees. And at the end, you, dear reader, are left in leaf piles of maybes, where the white-tailed deer of sadness are looking on. Yes, we must stand in mystery. The frozen eye of clarity cannot take everything in. I have done my best to leave behind the machine. Anyone with a mind who cares can enter, he writes. Zapruder is not only a prolific poet, he is also a translator, a musician, a professor, an editor of wave books, an essayist, and a memoirist. In Why Poetry, he talks to us about how to teach poetry and talks to us with humility about how we are doing it wrong. It's a book I highly recommend to all the teachers that I know. His latest book is a memoir, which he'll be reading from tonight in part, called Story of a Poem. It's currently a nominee for the National Book Critics Award in this category. This book feels like an unfurling and unfurling and unfurling of experience and self-portrait within the frames of fatherhood, of parenting a neurodiverse child, of being a writer and a poet and a citizen in the face of all we now face. His mind truly does wring beauty from the suffering air, and that's an intentional misprision from Mary Carr's blurb. You'll see why. If I can turn this. Uh, I want to mention he has a new book of poems forthcoming from Scribner called I Love Hearing Your Dreams, and we will patiently, impatiently be waiting for it. We're so fortunate to be listening in tonight, doing so, as he himself puts it, before the enormous spiral of wrecking balls in a dress and I think I see Dickinson here, made of laughing glass. All the ghosts are here listening tonight, too. Please join me in welcoming Matt Zapruder. Joni, that was amazing. Um, thank you. Um, it's a real privilege to be back here. Thank you to everyone here at the Poetry Center. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Arizona, for being here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, let's see. I'm going to read a bit from this memoir that Joni talked about. And then I'm going to read some poems from Father's Day, and then I'll read some new poems that are um, uh, going to be in this book, I Love Hearing Your Dreams. I haven't really read these new poems very much. Um, I haven't been giving that many readings over the past year, just through circumstance. So some of them will be as new to me as they are to you, practically. So uh, thank you for your patience in advance. Um, and I'll probably dip into the memoir a few times along the way. So we'll see how this goes. We'll just, we'll be on a journey together, man. It's going to be okay. Um, so uh, I just want to say briefly about this book, just so you know what this is. Um, in fall 2018, um, I had been writing poems that eventually ended up in the book Father's Day. I'd been writing a lot of poems quickly, kind of like a poem a day type thing. And I'd sort of write one and either it would be a keeper, it wouldn't, and I was moving fast. And I just felt like I needed to slow down. So I came up with this idea to write a poem as slowly as I could, a single poem, and to write about writing it, and do it every day. And that was sort of the idea behind um, generating the material that eventually came into this book. The other thing is that fall 2018, was a difficult time 
for us nationally, it was a time of turmoil that we seem to be entering into again politically. It was also a really tough time in the Bay Area where I live. It was the first really bad fire season. Um, a lot of wearing of masks and just not being able to breathe outside. So the sort of reality of climate change really hit very hard that year. Um, and uh, just a few years before, um, my son had been diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum and which is, you know, was a big change in kind of my parenting expectations and my wife's. And so we were processing that. And, um, you know, so that's also part of what I was trying to work my way through. Oh, and I also quit drinking at the same time. So it was a very exciting time. It was like a lot going on. So um, it was either the perfect time or the worst possible time to quit drinking. I don't know, but it was, anyway. So all that's happening. So the book kind of traces this one poem and it has, like drafts in it, as you can see. And um, so I write about writing and about parenting and about reading and about all kinds of things. And um, Joni, I'm glad to hear it. You think it holds together. So um, so I'll read a bit from it and then move into some poems and then kind of do that. So thank you again for listening. I woke up in California, first draft. It's 5 a.m. and the busy street is quiet. Outside the window, the leaves of the trees are black. Wires slice through the darkness, making dark shapes. The sky gradually becomes visible. I can feel Sarah and Simon still asleep in the rooms behind me. For a moment, I can almost imagine I'm at the prow of a ship, sitting still as the world rotates into unhelpful light. A little tremor shakes the desk, and I feel a flash of panic, but it's not an earthquake, just a lone truck passing. Last night, as I was putting him to bed, I told him that something would happen in two sleeps. It's something I've heard other parents say, and I found it coming out of my mouth. I didn't know if he'd heard me, lost as he so often was in singing one of his favorite songs. Often he will seem not to hear, but then a few hours or days later will repeat what was said or answer a question asked minutes or even hours ago. Sometimes months later, he will repeat something I said to him laughing. It's as if he and I are in an endless conversation, the pace of which is slower than I could ever have imagined. All summer, I had been writing a new poem every morning and, see, and emailing it to Matt. He would send me a new poem back too. I told myself and believed that these were just practice for what would eventually be the real writing, a neat trick impossible to deliberately replicate. I never had a plan or any idea where to begin. I would sometimes choose a phrase that seemed to glow with at least a little potential. This autumn morning, I remember Matt once showed me how you can start a poem by putting one or two lines in the middle of the page and then writing out from them, alternating a line before, then one after. He said this method came to him in a dream. Two sleeps, I type in the middle of the page, then roll the platen up one line to type above it, something that could make sense, a line before, then back down to type something that could go after. In the redwoods, two sleeps, watch over. Watch over what? I don't know. It's just a beginning, but as Bob Haas says, you can't revise nothing. Not until nothing becomes a few words. When you have no ideas or too many, it's best to find a few words that seem to have potential, for now inexplicable. The painter Degas once said to his friend Mallarmé, I want to write poems, but I have too many ideas. Mallarmé replied, poems, my dear Degas, are not made of ideas, but of words. Poetry makes nothing happen, W.H. Auden wrote, which doesn't mean it does nothing. It makes nothing happen. It activates the silence. You begin, and now there's something to listen to. Um, this first poem is called Poem for Doom. Poem for Doom. Birds don't lie. They're never lost. 
Above the earth, they never think, I stole this form, or blue is the best. I listen to it, singing, my old man is far away, singing American songs, stolen from those who lived in what now is, but was not the park, which makes me love him. I'm eating an orange someone grabbed from nature. Over me, I hear controlled, mechanical, obsidian dragonflies search for anarchists. For a long time, I went to school in the palm of my life, carrying a stone, obeying the law of semblance. Now each night, I bring it back, down to the land asphodels cover. Then I wake and take my son out on the porch to say, hello, everything. Hello, green hills that slept. Hello, tree drawn on the side of a white truck, exorably rumbling towards some hole. Hello, magnolia, whose pink and white blossoms have left it for where, oh, sweet doom, we are all going. Then, behind us, we close the black door with the golden knob and sit in the great chair, morning light through the shades always makes look like a dream forest throne. All around, our subjects, the shadow trees, rise up, their private thoughts filling the room. I take them like an animal with gentle, ungrateful ceremony from a leaf takes dew. completely tripping, not having slept with, a, with an infant, obviously, when I wrote that poem, I was like <laughs> losing my mind, you know. But it is that dream state when you have a little kid is the best, you know, you're kind of like, the whole thing is a dream um, that you never wake up from. Uh, this next poem's called I Met My Wife. Everything I say in it is true about how I met her. Um, I met her in Amherst, Massachusetts which, as you know, is the home of Emily Dickinson. I met my wife. I met my wife in a bar you could throw a Frisbee from and hit Emily Dickinson's grave, which would be uncool and not. Until that night, my whole life had been a conference where voices amiably disagreed until paralysis ensued. When I looked in her face, something actually for the first time spoke, saying, home is where you've never lived, not yet. What else? Before she said it, I knew her Old Testament name. Home, as everyone knows, is hard. In each room, the most terrible moments keep lasting. Obscure green velvet continual past light from under every doorway pours into the hallway, you are drawn to enter and fear. It's horrible and good to go through each door in every room, to keep standing in that green light, to spread your arms and take it into your fur. No fantasy is ever better. Still alive, you open your eyes and go back down the stairs to find the other in the kitchen stirring something. Someone says, have a cookie, it won't kill you. <laughs> um, this poem's called Father's Day, it's a title poem of this, of this book. I always feel like I should give a little bit of a content warning for any kids who are in the audience. Um, Father's Day. Yesterday we walked down to the park, the worn one our dear city tries to maintain, next to the library. A flash of terror. My kid ran through people playing soccer to the swings. I talked to some dads, nice business guys, with the usual deep sorrow wells I recognize from the mirror. Their eyes were wild, were all waiting with dread for Father's Day. 
We don't deserve a little brunch followed by a sleepy blowjob. We all know merely to survive this totally survivable life is not enough. What good will it do? We must not think this is some dream. The children sleeping alone in some detention center don't need our brilliant sincerity. It's not enough to give some money, make some calls. They are not ours, but they are. We are the first new fathers. Ours failed where we cannot. Stop waiting. There are no others. Okay, I'll try to rescue the, the, my, 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 what I just did to any children in the audience by reading this poem. It's called, uh, When I Was 15, I, I was asked to write for this anthology, like it was the 15th anniversary of McSweeney's, and so they were like, write a poem about, write something about when you were 15. So I took this very literally. Um, I grew up on the East Coast, and so I mentioned down, down coat. I guess you guys, have, you have to wear down coats here, right? Because it's got mountains and so, okay. Yeah, so. Sometimes I read a place that's like, what? is down. What is a coat? <laughs> when I was 15, when I was 15, I suddenly knew I would never understand geometry. Who was my teacher? That name is gone. I only remember the gray feeling in a classroom filled with vast theoretical distances. I can still see odd shapes drawn on the board and those inscrutable formulas, everyone was busily into their notebooks scribbling. I looked down at the Velcro straps of my entirely white shoes and knew inside me things had long ago gone terribly wrong and would continue to be. When the field hockey star broke her knee, I wrote a story for the school paper, and then brought her the history notes in the snow she stood in the threshold, a whole firelit life of mysterious familial warmth glowing behind her, and took them from my hands, like the blameless queen of elegant violence she was. Walking home, encased in immense amounts of down, I listened to the analog ghost in the machine pour from the cassette I'd drawn flowers on. Into my ears it sang, Everything they told you makes you believe you're trapped in a snow globe, forgotten in a dark closet, where exhausted shadows argue what is sorrow cannot become joy. But I am here from the future to tell you you are not. All you must do is stay asleep a few more years, great traveler waiting to go. How's everybody doing okay? Good, okay, good. Um, I like to read this poem and I read it at universities. It's called Graduation Day. I teach it, I teach it at a college. And so, you know, I'm a faculty member, so at commencement I have to like put on the regalia, right? Although mine is borrowed. So every year I have to borrow it and it's always the wrong color. But, but, um, so, but you have to sit up there and it's, when you're faculty and you're facing and everybody's you know, graduating, you have to look attentive, you know, the whole time. It's hours, you have to look attentive. And it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard to be attentive. You know, because, I mean, I don't know most of the people graduating, right? So I'm like, theoretically happy for them, but like, actually, I want to be home. Um, so, sorry to break the spell. But anyway, so I, one year I decided I was going to write a poem, like during the thing, but I was going to do it like, like just like this in my notebook and like I was going to, you know, with my hand like that. So I took these notes and then I went home and I wrote this, um, this poem called Graduation Day. So, Graduation Day. Drawn by ceremonial obligation up from sleep, I woke and stepped into the borrowed black robes, all ghost bureaucrats, trained to redirect dreaming, pretend we do not like to wear. I drove my black car to the stadium to sit on stage and be watched, watching young expectant spirits, one by one, with dread certainty pass before me, clouded in their names. Then listened to no one in their speeches say, you're welcome for allowing us not to tell you it's already too late to learn anything 
or defend whatever accidental instrument in us causes all these useless thoughts. Like, if you walked for hours through the vast black avenues of those server farms, all of us with our endless attention built, you could almost feel the same peaceful disinterest as when your parents, talking and smoking, raise their heads for a moment to smile and tell you, go back upstairs and read the book you love about myths that explain weather and death. Now it is almost June, and they're finally the children they always were. So more precise than anyone has ever had to be, go forget everything we told you so you can fix what we kept destroying by calling the future. And I don't think I'm going to get asked to re, uh, be the commencement speaker where I, where I teach. <laughs> Thankfully. Um, so here's another thing that's strange. Um, there's a, you know those magazines that have like an airplanes and trains and stuff that are like in the, you know, like in the, in the pocket and then you, you know. Um, for a while, they had this magazine at Amtrak. I don't know if they still do. It's called The National, which is kind of like a hip name for like a magazine for a train. Anyway, so they had this idea that they were going to um, ask a poet each month to write a poem for the magazine, and they asked me to do it. And being the literalist that I obviously am, I wrote a poem about riding the train, which I did a lot when I was a kid in, on, in the East Coast, you know, up and down, like between New York and D.C. and Boston, D.C. So, and I was thinking about how like, there are these moments in our civic life that are these ritualistic moments of communion that we don't have really have names for or acknowledge, like when we're all doing something together. And like one of those moments is like when we all get on a train and no matter, doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, whatever, everybody gets on a train, kind of does the same thing. It sits there and there's this sort of silence there that's almost like sacred before the train goes. And I was just thinking about how this, it's, it's, it's strange that there's this collective thing we do that, that brings everyone together, like sort of outside of any other considerations of similarity or difference. So that was what I found myself writing about in this poem. It's called Poem for Passengers. Like all strangers who temporarily find themselves moving in the same direction, we look out the window without really seeing or down at our phones trying to catch the dying signal then the famous lonesome whistle so many singers have sung about blows and our bodies shudder. Soon we will pick up speed and pass the abandoned factories there's lately been so much conversation about. Through broken windows they stare, asking us to decide, but we fall asleep next to each other, riding into the tunnel, sharing without knowing the same dream. In it, we're carrying something, an empty casket, somehow so heavy, only together can we carry it over a bridge in the snow. Emerging suddenly into the light, we wake and open our laptops, or a book about murder, or a glossy magazine. Though we're mostly awake, part of us still goes on solving problems so great they cannot be named. Even once we've reached our destination and disembark into whatever weather, for a long time, there's a compartment within us filled with analog silence. Inside us, the dream goes on and on. Okay, I'll read a couple more poems from um, this book and then I'll read some new poems. which is going to be great. I'm going to really enjoy it and feel super confident when I'm doing that because that is what my life coach told me to say in these moments. I don't really have a life coach. Um, I was thinking about, this is before COVID I wrote this poem, but I was thinking at this time about how weird it is that we talk about things going viral. That was creeped me out. I didn't like, it was like, ugh, sounds gross. Like, you know, and so I was thinking particularly about like certain poets I know who've had poems go viral, you know, and how weird that must feel. Like it's sort of like having written happy birthday or something. Suddenly you're like cursed with this poem that everybody, yeah. 
So I, so I imagine what it would be like to write a viral poem, which I, obviously is never going to happen. But like, but, but, but so it was, this is spoken from the point of view of somebody who, who had the misfortune of writing a viral poem. It's called The Black Bird. I wrote a poem once. I thought it was, to be honest, just OK. Then it went viral. Everyone loved it. And soon enough, I almost did too. Though I also knew something nameless, I pushed down ever deeper. I wrote more, a whole book named after the viral poem. It won all the awards. People even really named a whole conference after it and wept when they even thought about it. It was far too much, so extreme, it had to be real what I had done. Now, whenever I try to write, I feel so afraid of feeling nothing. So I just write house and war and dapple. Everyone smiles and says, yes. But really, I just want to get high and sit on the porch of my heart. Yes, of my heart, that's what I said. Where I can watch the city go by and imagine buildings have feelings. But whenever I close my eyes and try to go there, I only see a black bird with a yellow beak staring at me. I keep waiting, but it just stares back at me and does not speak even one word from the other world. Um, OK. So this new book is called I Love Hearing Your Dreams. Um, my wife's like, no, you don't. <laughs> uh, but I do. I, I grouse about it, but it's like a bit, you know? Because like, I actually really do like hearing your dreams, but I kind of have this bit where I'm like, oh, I have my dreams again. But like, I actually really I do like it, you know? So <laughs> I love hearing your dreams. Like those poems I write in my sleep and forget. The ones that babble some essential message to the trees I can only walk towards in that particular dark I see when I turn away from the world. Returning, I always forget my best work. Like those forgotten poems, your dreams have no hidden agenda to be wise. They're made to be forgotten so something can be known. Tonight, I was woken by a light passing along our shade. I heard you cry out. You would not stop until I gently shook you. Your eyes in the ordinary light through the window were still yours, yet you wore a distant face, not like a mask at all. Before you spoke, your face became a sun, an animal, a chair, you looked as if you just discovered you were holding keys to a lake. You could still hear your parents laughing. They were not yet married. On your face, things kept turning into each other, pages left in the wind. Then I heard you say it was the strangest thing. It was summer, the wind blew. It was summer, the wind blew away from me, and I stayed here thinking about a certain mountain. Things got green, then forgot, and in their forgetting, remembered everything that was not grass or me. My son forgot he could not swim, then emerged tall as laughter, hidden as the lesson in a song. He forgot how to tie his shoes, then learned how to draw a face and tie it to a string and run far off into the place only he could go. I chased him, but he just grew larger. For a week, he became a carpenter. Hammering filled my heart. My heart went to the hardware store and bought all the napping spatulas. It was summer, so I let them stay up all night or they let me. We swung from the magnolia. Our great leaves fell. It remained our friend. 
Each day was that same sweet holiday that never ended until the windows got soft. It was summer. Candles came on like televisions. That was the last time things were real. Um, I was talking about dictionaries today in this class I visited, and this poem is called My Grandmother's Dictionary. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth about this poem, which is that I was reading, I was on, I, I don't like to spend time on social media, I'm going to confess, it's not my favorite thing, okay, I know. But, um, but I, was, I was looking on Twitter and there was some editor who like, a poetry editor who posted this thing, I'm so sick of poems about people's grandmothers and where they look up the Latin and Greek meanings of things in dictionaries. And I was like, I shall write that poem. And, and so uh, this is that poem, um, deliberately designed. Um, it's called My Grandmother's Dictionary. It must have arrived in the hands of a salesman whose name shall remain unrecorded. Let's call him the handsome stranger. She saw him through the little window next to the door and knew, although she did not believe she believed in such things, she had loved him in a former life. She gave him a glass of her legendary tea and let him go. My grandfather was upstairs in the immaculate attic where after they died, I found this typewriter sleeping among old blueprints. During the war, he diagrammed routes so trucks of soldiers could arrive precisely in time to wait for their orders, or he worked in parts. I don't remember. I can only picture that afternoon he told me exactly who he had been. I hear the resigned tone, but not what he said. I was, as is my nature, staring out the kitchen window, thinking some great hypothesis that could easily be disproved. That day, now lost in the book, no one can ever turn around and read. This was in a little town that was a harbor, its restaurant a windmill, replica turning in no wind. We never asked her why she always stood in the darkest part of any room. Once she looked up from her eternal soup long enough to say to me, you really must remove that terrible beard. What is the name of that sort of love? I wanna look it up. I think it comes from the Latin for not knowing the Greek, for the particular quiet of that afternoon, I finally gave in and picked up the forbidden ceramic lion from the shelf. It slipped from my hands that already trembled as they do today and hit the very thick carpet with a silent thud exploding into so many tiny pieces. Out of the kitchen, she came with a broom, and we both pretended it was never there. What is that sort of love? The dictionary knows. I opened it and found dust. I remember it had a solitary gold stripe across blue-gray fabric, like a dress you wear only once by the sea. Um, I mentioned, and when I was reading in the prose thing, you know, I mentioned that the, that poem I started began with that phrase, two sleeps, you know, I typed in the middle of the page, the poem went through a lot of drafts and in the course of the drafts that, 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 um, that phrase just got cut from the poem, from the final poem. Um, and I sent this poem to, uh, I sent the book to Mary Rufel. And she wrote me a very lovely note about the book. You know, she's very kind. And she, but she said, you know, I was sad because I missed the phrase, two sleeps, like what happened to it, which is like such a Mary Rufel thing to say, right? And so, so I wrote this poem for her called Two Sleeps. So it sort of like closes the circle of the two sleeps for Mary Rufel. When the other father told his child something will happen in two sleeps, at first I didn't understand. He meant something comforting. Time passing with quick ease, a way to measure nights numbered in unearned peace. I just thought of my own two sleepers who often wake, waking me, though even in sleep I'm always already awake at that oddest hour that does not end, the crooked 
unnumbered one. Then they fall back into their respective oblivions. I lie shrouded in this barge that does not cross the river, listening. No music of the dead, no wise silence, no penultimate dream. I just worry every particle can now be counted, that we are all caretakers of a dying patient named the self or the sea. I lie here and worry, I'm worrying about all the wrong things. According to some system, I worry I myself created, probably in my sleep. It is very utterly dark. Like a branch in total darkness, I cannot be discerned. All night, I stand beneath the tree. Um, are you like all like outdoorsy people here in Tucson? Probably you are. Um, I, I, uh, I did a thing. I did like taught a workshop in a place where they had bears, right? And um, so they had to warn, give us like a warning, you know, like what to do if you run into a bear. And I know it's like one of two things. You're either supposed to like play dead or like attack it and scream and yell. It's like, I cannot remember which one it is. And it seems like super important to remember which one because you get it wrong, obviously. So, so, so they were like, they were like, okay, like here's what you do if you run into a bear. And it, I like finally was like, oh, okay, I can remember that. So anyway, this is instruction. So this is like not only a poem that you can enjoy, but also um, it's like useful in case you run into a bear. Now I don't know if this applies to all kinds of bears, so don't like you have to do a little research on that. But, but um, anyway, it's called Bad Bear. Bad bear. If you see one, you can say bad bear right to its face, even if you're not sure. Maybe it's good and has discretion in relation to the delicious treasury of human garbage or even the eternal work of bees. Who knows? But it's okay on the path with your thunder voice unequivocally to condemn it. Lore says that will make it leave, so you can go tell your story in the tent, and again at the table, laughing without asking what violence brought you there, you and all that food from everywhere, those flowers you eat, and do not wonder who told you it's okay to lie, even to the rich, or to save a life, even your own, in the middle of night in the cave, you will hear the eternal question, even darker than what surrounds. Was I born this way, or was it circumstance that condemned me? Silence answers, you were born to be condemned everywhere but in poems. For a while, you hang dead leaves on the night tree, then they fall away, and all that is left is this honey you stole from the world. Um, I'll read a couple more and then I will read a bit, just a little bit for the memoir and then we'll be done. So. Um, I kind of want to read this poem because I, I was asked to do the podcast here um, where, where you get to pick things from the archives, like point them out. It's like a really, it's a great podcast I recommend. Like, so they ask poets and, the, and you like choose readings and do like a little audio thing. And I found um, an audio of Gerald Stern uh, who passed away you know, not so long ago, the great poet Gerald Stern reading his, his poem Lucky Life um, here, which is a great reading of it. And um, I was thinking after that that how I you know, he passed away and then I was thinking about how a long time ago, a friend of mine and I tried to go to a party at his house. My friend had gone to grad school with him and we went, we drove from Boston to New York and we got there and um, it was the wrong night. Um, and we were like all excited to go to a real, our first real party with poets and it was the wrong night that we were there. So we drove back. Um, and dead, so the poem's called Dead Flowers, which of course is the name of a, of a great song by the Rolling Stones. Dead Flowers for Gerald Stern. Now that you are gone, I'll never get hit by a piano dropped from a cloud. 
I'll probably die holding a book I told everyone that I read. Without you, everything will be the same. My son turns his light on so early. I've already thought unspeakable thoughts. And you will never drive again along some river with too many consonants in its name. It will keep flowing north like the Nile, crying tears of comprehending joy without irony or shame. It is said you were always talking about how good you were at dancing. It is said you wore a hat made of straw that you stole from the perfectly preserved room of a dead poet. It is said you said he didn't need it anymore. I told my friend I was going to write you in the hospital, but as is my way, I keep learning if you don't write it down, the thought just flies away. Where does it go? Maybe into the trees or someone else's head. And isn't that the point anyway? Now that you are gone, I can say to every pigeon I pass that it was beautiful to be a nun having unspeakable thoughts. And you will not hear me, or maybe, who knows? I remember going to your door on the wrong evening with a friend I see no longer. The party was next weekend. We listened to dead flowers all the way back to Boston in shame. Now that you are gone, I can finally write this poem. I can say the only true thing. I remember going to your door. Okay, um, one more and then I'll read a bit. Um, I think, do you all like Ruby Cower? Should I write Ruby Cower? You like Ruby Cower? Let's read a poem for her. Yeah. Um, this is called Poem for Ruby Cower. Um, I think it's a bad rap. She's, you know, people don't like her because she's popular, but. Poem for Ruby Cower. Lying in bed at 3 a.m., listening to him cough in his bear pajamas is not fun. There's no joy, right now or ever, now that I know my heart lives outside my body, in him and the grass and my wife. Because you wrote defeated eyes, I know you understand how I feel when I say the high fever of night. There are no defenses. Again, I do the math. Will I live long enough to see him thrive in what sort of world we are living, not in, but on? You know what I mean. One of the continents is on fire. You are not wrong to think in poems we can solve something complicated. A lot of things are not information. Here in the middle of complicated night, it has become clear we cannot trust the central metaphor, which is we are children. Though it is true, we are not safe anywhere. I love my son, his little bear pajamas, my wife, the grass, the ends of poems. Um, and just a bit from the memoir. Thank you again for, for listening, for being here. Um, this, this little passage, it's not too long, starts with a quote from the French poet Paul Valéry, which is like a little bit hard to follow, but um, it's like him trying to describe where lines of poetry come from. And he has this theory that like, there's this tree of the imagination that's like, we can't, and it's a fruit falls from it into our world. And then our job as poets is to make the tree that the fruit could be on. And that's, that's what a poem is, is that tree, the fruit of the line can hang on. You're looking at me like I'm nuts. I, I'm just telling you what he said, okay, like don't. Um, so I'm gonna read his words, but it helps sometimes to think about it first, because it's, Paul Valéry wrote the following. A fine line of poetry is a fruit plucked from the tree, but which tree? This leads to the curious point of trying to make the tree whose fruit would be this fruit. Finally, then, it is the fruit of two trees, one hidden, unknowable, which produced the fruit, the other, the work, in which the fruit takes a more or less necessary place. According to Wikipedia, to form a fruit, 
One tree sends the pollen out. It drifts until it finds the other. Some trees do self-pollinate, it is true, but those trees grow less fruit. Sometimes Wikipedia is as beautiful as any poem. This is Wikipedia right now. The pollination process requires a carrier for the pollen, which can be animal, wind, or human intervention. You've been given the line, the image, the idea. Like a child or a new love, it is never what you expected. It wants you to change your life. You hear the line. It comes from somewhere. You've gathered or maybe fathered it. It comes to you or you to it. No one can tell you how it happens. Sometimes you write for a while feeling nothing until almost unnoticed, something starts with mysterious life to glow. You feel yourself resist its strangeness. What does it mean? Is that what I meant to say? What do you do with it then? You cannot turn away. Make somewhere for it to live and belong. It is your job to imagine and invent that tree on which the treasured fruit could happily thrive. The strange treasure of a line or image or symbol or word or thought or moment needs the poem so that it can be more than itself in isolation so that it can be truly perceived. And now I'm talking to myself here. Try to remember the whole point of writing that first draft is just to hear the music. And then once you hear the music, you look for what could contain it. Reverse engineering, farewell old tree, hello something else from which can hang the music you have found. Try to be quiet for once, to listen for something you love. Let it come to you. Then build a structure in which what you love, a line, an image, a word can exist, a situation, a scene, a sonnet, a chazal, an ode, an abandoned palace, a happy graveyard, a breeze, a ghost ship's wake, a map in winter, a rose factory, someone crossing the ocean in a fabulously unseaworthy craft, a marriage, a meal, a crucial childhood memory that never occurred, a radio being endlessly, impatiently tuned, so on and so on and so on, until the line can live there. You hear them, then the poem can begin. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Uh, Matthew travels in two weeks uh, to go to New York City for the National Book Critics Circles Award for that book that we just heard from. So one more round of applause for him and to wish him well on that journey. Um, Matthew also mentioned our podcast, and so that was a great plug. And if you don't listen to it, it's called Poetry Centered. His episode is one of the great ones in it, and there's about 40 plus of them now. And they're awesome. Yeah, a contemporary poet kind of takes you through the archive and shares poems that they love and the voices of those poets as they read them here in Tucson. So uh, you can find that on all your favorite podcast platforms. Uh, and I hope to see you back here on March 14th for John Murillo's visit and reading. Thanks again, everybody, for coming. One more round of applause for Matthew Zapruder. <laughs> Books are for sale, and Matthew would be happy to sign them. So this is a great time to go do that part. Thanks for coming, everybody.